Competition, friendly or otherwise, is at the heart of the sailing communities all across Canada. At the Royal St. Lawrence Yacht Club in Montreal, competition at both local and international levels is considered to be of paramount importance. The club's passion for racing is evident, as it has been one of Canada's most prolific yacht clubs at producing world champions and Olympians in the sport of sailing. This episode will focus on the Royal St. Lawrence Yacht Club's history of creating Olympic racers, future Olympic hopefuls, and what the Royal has meant for Canadian representation in a sport primarily dominated by countries who are a little closer to the equator. The Royal's first brushes with the Olympics happened after World War II. The club members' interest in competing in the Games was sparked by the simple and long overdue idea that they had as much to offer as any other sailors in Canada, and the rest of the world for that matter. And so, in 1952, with their club burgee in hand, Doug Woodward and Andy Hugeson represented Canada in Helsinki, Finland. They did not bring home any medals that year, but respectfully came mid-fleet. Royal sailors would go to race in multiple boat classes and often have double representation in the games. Canada would continue to finish about mid-fleet for a number of years until Everett Bastet came within a hair of the bronze medal in 1976 when the Olympics were being hosted by the Royals home, Montreal. I've been a member of the Olympic team seven times spanning from 1968 to 1992. I started my uh, Olympic sailing when I was 17, but I started my sailing when I was seven. I grew up next door to the Yacht Club, and so the, uh, the club was my extended backyard. I hung around the junior sailing program, although I was too young to join. The, the minimum age was 10 at that time, but because I was so persistent, uh, they let me in when I was eight years old. <laughs> at one point, I got invited to uh, sail on a Flying Dutchman class boat on a Saturday when I was uh, 16 years old. And uh, that was very exciting for me because I had seen other members of the club that had gone to previous Olympics. And uh, I guess uh, Olympics was a dream of mine. Luckily for us, Everett Bastet pulled through in 1984 and took home silver for Canada. To this day, he is the only Canadian sailor to have made the podium. This is it right here. So it's a, a great souvenir. Uh, from all the sailing I've done uh, through the years. There we are. <laughs> Although we've only made the podium one time, the Olympic dream lives on at the Royal St. Lawrence Yacht Club. Today, the dream is being kept alive by two young and passionate sailors from Montreal. Meet Ariel Morgan and Heather Myatt are two Olympic hopefuls from the Royal St. Lawrence. Both having grown up at the club and in its junior sailing program, the two have been best of friends and fierce sailing companions for a decade now. For the past two years, they've been gunning for the Olympics, and if passion and ferocity are any indicators of ability and achievement, there's little doubt that they will one day reach their goal. We both grew up sailing here at the Royal St. Lawrence. Uh, I was in the Optimist Racing Program, so the little boats for kids, and Heather was in the uh, Instructional Program, just learning how to sail. And uh, after a few years, uh, I was moving out of the little boats into something bigger, and Heather was looking to join a race team, and we had a friend that put us together. And uh, we sort of knew each other a bit before, but uh, not that well, and then we started sailing together, and that was nine years ago. And so we've been sailing together in uh, so two different junior classes and then now in the Olympic class of the 49er FX together. We came from sort of different backgrounds. So Heather had a lot of experience sailing the boat that we were in, but not much racing experience. And I had a lot of experience racing, but I'd just come out of the junior boats. So there was a lot of uh, me talking about what we, was doing, what we were doing for racing and her teaching me how to sail the boat, which was sort of an interesting yeah. dynamic. Ariel was also not used to sailing with another person. Yeah. She came out of a single-handed boat and she was, she was, she's the one that <laughs> skippers, so Ariel drives the boat. And so little communication errors on when when we were gonna be tacking, when we were gonna be driving, when the other person needed to get inside the boat. 
Yeah. We worked it out though. Yeah. <laughs> Took a little time to get used to talking to someone else about what I was doing, but <laughs> I've gotten a bit better since okay. then, so. <laughs> Our goal is to qualify for the 2016 Olympics, which are in Rio in Brazil. And uh, it's quite a challenge. There's a few, sort of two things that have to happen for us to make it there. Um, the first is that the country has to qualify, and the second is that we have to be the one boat that's selected to represent Canada. So once Canada gets its spot at the Olympics, which uh, it's on track for, then there's a selection committee that looks at um, a series of results from events, and based on those results, we'll select a boat to represent the country. And so as it stands right now, there's two of us that are in contention for that spot, so we're working really hard to be the number one boat and uh, get picked for that spot that we'll hopefully earn as well, so. As Canadians, Sometimes we become a little overzealous when attributing blame for our failures to the weather. But the truth is that in sailing, Canadians are competing with a severe handicap, as our practice season is only about six months of the year. Whereas in most other sailing-centric countries, they have the privilege of practicing all year round. Our climate makes things particularly difficult and expensive to train properly in order to make the podium. If our athletes want to practice from November to March, they have to travel somewhere with a more agreeable climate or a body of water that isn't frozen over at the very least. But even though our country's environment isn't ideal, as Canadians, we tackle the obstacle head on and learn to prevail despite the difficulties. One of the things people talk about so often about getting good at sailing, the same as in any other sport, is you need the hours. You need to practice and practice and practice. And in Canada, it's pretty hard to get those hours because the sailing season is only two to four months, depending on how cold you actually want to brave. Um, and so you do need to take it upon yourself. You do need to take it when, when camp is over. You need to go out in the evenings. You need to go out on the weekends. You need to take it upon yourself to get the extra training when your coaches aren't there. Once you get on the Quebec team, national team, that kind of stuff, um, your program is almost laid out for you, coaching and all that kind of stuff, but um, you still need to have that initiative. You still need to put in the hours and do stuff on your own um, to get anywhere because other teams, other countries, they're sailing year-round and you need, to, you need to get as many hours on the water as you can. I think there's also like having like starting to go to Florida in the winter, like at a certain point, and once you reach a certain level, you sort of have to do that to, like I said, get the hours in. And part of that comes with a lot of like parent support. Like, you know, when we were 15 and 16 or maybe 17, I don't know, but our moms drove us to Florida to make sure we could get down and do some training in the winter and that sort of thing. And so uh, I think a challenge for a lot of people is if they don't have sort of the family support there, whether financial or just time, uh, it can be hard to keep progressing in the sport. I think like it, like any sport. So uh, we're both really lucky to really support our families and a really supportive community uh, helping us out. Canada, Quebec, we're not a mainstream sport, yet globally, you know, sailing's the national sport of France. You go look at the Olympic uh, results for England and Australia, and, and, and yachting drives their Olympic campaigns for a nation. It definitely helps when uh, you have a club or you're surrounded by people who are passionate about the same sport at different levels, but that's what I love about sailing is that you can go out on a course and uh, be new to the sport, have been in it for a year or two, or have been in it, in it for 30 years. We can all compete against each other. It's just a really good way to get people into the sport, to encourage them to come, come out and, and be, part of, uh, be part of the fun, be part of the team, be part of the excitement. The three of us have had a shot at uh, representing Canada at the Olympics. In those days, you didn't have to qualify. If you were the best in your nation, you went. Now these guys going to the Olympics, they had to qualify. So you have to go and sail against the rest of the world. Uh, when we went to the Olympics in 72, the people that we sailed against, we met for the first time. 
Olympic experience was incredible. Um, I had some friends that were actually there that I was able to spend time with. And obviously to see other athletes in other sports um, is really a, a treat as well. That's one of the reasons I love the games is that you actually get to witness other, other teams, other sports. Coming together with all the other athletes, we don't do that enough in sport. You know, we're all in our own individual disciplines, and they'll group certain people together. But this is a time where you can come and see the the Cuban volleyball players and the Romanian powerlifter, you know, the gymnasts. And so you walk around, and it's it's a wild experience that you're part of this this real global entity. I think my most one of my most memorable events of going to the Olympics was the opening ceremonies in Mexico and walking uh, through the entranceway into the stadium and uh, to the roar of the, the, uh, the crowds. And uh, as we went around the track, we could see in the crowds so many Canadian flags being flown. Montreal did a phenomenal thing. They brought in all the Olympians, old and young, and they were about 2,500 athletes. Denis Cardin he, uh, set up a great, great night. And there's only a few places in the world that have an Olympic cauldron and the Olympic rings up on a building. And that was one heck of a party. It was just interesting meeting all the different Olympians and meeting the ones that you've, you haven't seen in a long time. It also raises your awareness of what you've been able to participate in. Another royal sailor who went to the Olympics on multiple occasions was Ian Bruce. He also designed the now extremely popular dinghy, the Laser. It's hard to, to categorize the Laser, but if you look at the Laser in the sport of sailing, uh, it's not like you invented the light bulb, but it's pretty close. Like, this is, this is one of the most popular boats in the history of the sport, the most significant of the sport that has developed more parts of the world into the sport of sailing was right here. Hanging around the yacht club so much, I, I couldn't help but notice that Ian Bruce was developing a new single-handed boat. It's uh, about 14 feet long and uh, a very simple design. And so uh, I got to sail the prototype boat and uh, play around with that. It, it eventually became a, a world-class uh, boat, which is now an Olympic class. The world was an armament race in sailing. It, if I was sailing against you and you bought a new compass, I would have to buy the compass to compete with you if, I bought, if you bought a new sail. So I, I had to keep up all the time. There wasn't a, a common boat that you could afford and I could afford that we didn't touch. So that when you beat me, you beat me. If I beat you, then it wasn't the boat, it was us. So um, my partner Ian and a fellow called uh, Bruce Kirby, who's from the Seahawk Club, uh, over drinks or talking and, and sailing, uh, doodled a little boat that could be everybody's boat and it was a laser and had we had no idea at the time I wasn't even working with Ian at that time but that it would be the right boat at the right place at the right time and luck because the whole world was thinking if we could only have a common boat and uh, we, we built the boat we built a factory that would build the boat uh, we took the boat with us to the Olympics now we're introduced to all the best in the country. And each one of those guys was a hero in this country and took the knowledge of there's a little boat called the Laser that's available. We should get it for our country. So we went from the top down. And uh, at the high point, we had nine plants going in the world. We were young. Uh, we worked 20-hour uh, days and, and loved it and we were building about 18,000 boats a year. We changed sailing in the world. If you look at a yacht club anywhere, go to Bali, go to Ch Russia, Hong Kong, go to Sweden, you'll find a laser in the backyard. And if you go to the Olympics, 
and ask the people who are sailing, they've all sailed a laser. There isn't anybody who hasn't sailed a laser. We did 11 different international classes, and I, I don't think there's anybody else that has even come close to that. And we're proud of it, you know. And, uh, we're proud of you, Dad. <laughs> yeah, Dad, good job. Thank you. Thanks. Fundraising is, is a huge part of our time, you know, it's a part of it's sailing and in the gym and technical stuff and then part of it's logistics and then one of the biggest parts and one of the most important things is fundraising and making sure we can afford to do it. In my day, the Sport Canada funding was higher per athlete than it is now. Uh, back then there were only seven Olympic classes in sailing, so whatever funds the government had was only split through the, the seven classes. Now there's uh, 11 or 12 classes. And I wouldn't be surprised if the uh, government funding uh, may be at a lower level than it was back in my day. It was a pastime for us in 1970s. By 2000, now you have to go to the competition. You have to travel around the world. You need a budget. There's no such thing as a budget in my day. Is we all worked and we sailed on the weekend. Now, in the, in, when you go to the Olympics, you can't work. Your, your work is the Olympics. Financially, uh, it's a, an incredible difficulty or burden on some teams to try and come up with the funds to put together a, a proper Olympic campaign. And my team uh, certainly felt it. We, uh, we were always trying to fundraise or, or trying to find sponsorships, find uh, partnerships. We would work with other teams to potentially, potentially share coaching. I, I would take odd jobs. I'd take uh, any job that I could get when I was in town to try and uh, supplement our, my income and being able to live and make ends meet. Our funding comes from a mix of areas. We get a lot of support in terms of services from the Quebec team and the Canadian Sailing team. Uh, so we get a lot of coaching covered, personal trainer, nutritionist, and uh, sports psych. And then, but in terms of like financial support to cover the cost of our equipment, our travel, regatta fees, uh, most of that comes through a mix of personal donations, uh, like through a fundraiser, and uh, a few, we have some corporate sponsors as well. So uh, PWL Capital and Cassie have uh, supported us uh, to help us fundraise for our year because we run a budget of about $100,000 a year to do what we do. So it's, uh, we definitely need a lot of support and we're constantly fundraising, writing thank you notes, sending out notes, reaching out to people uh, to really support us to, to get where we want to be. We've learned a lot about how to market ourselves, how to, how to ask the right questions, how to, how to write, write proposal letters that are going to get people interested in giving their hard-earned money to two kids that are traveling around the world, tra like trying for this goal. And um, it's difficult, but I mean, you have to do it, you know? And you, the things that we have to do, it's more than, yeah, it's more than just on the water. It's probably, it's definitely a full-time job, the things that we do outside of sailing to, to make it all possible. Sailing takes place in a yacht club scene or a, 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 some kind of a gathering where sailboats are together. I was paraded down here when I was eight. And then our summers were Ross and Lawrence Yacht Club and, and sailing. And then graduation into racing and it becomes sort of a family for you. We both grew up sailing at the Royal St. Lawrence and we both went up through the junior program and both of our families grew up sailing here as well and they've been members forever, so the strength of the community is pretty strong. I remember always coming over on Saturdays and Sundays, either working the race committee and, and helping set up the races by the time we were like 11, 12 years old, uh, driving the motorboats around or going sailing uh, with, you know, if there was windy and you came down to the dock, they always needed more weight so you could get invited on the boat. Uh, so just everything you needed, or everything when I was a kid that I needed, was here. I didn't have to go anywhere. I mean, like you said, it's a, it's a fenced-in compact. We have a pool, there was tennis courts, there was sailing, there were movie nights. Everything was here. 
you know. Uh, and you had your heroes too, whether it was Pete going to the Olympics or Everett going to the Olympics, uh, and it's a, a multitude of other sailors here that uh, uh, all the drive that uh, was necessary just came from this area. I was influenced by all the, the members of the club here because a, a lot of them, of course, are volunteers to run the, run the programs and run the races and uh, members that were Olympians. Uh, um, so you look up to all these people and they, uh, and, uh, they help bring you along. We don't spend a lot of time here. Just training in Montreal is a little bit difficult with our schedule, um, but every time we're home, every time we're here, everyone is so excited to hear everything that's going on. My parents met here, actually, and yeah, so there's, <laughs> <laughs> so, like, we've been rooted here since we were really little, and uh, just every, everyone's support is so amazing. I think, like, our campaign would be so much more of a struggle right now if it weren't for the amazing support of our community. One of the number one reasons that we're in this boat right now is because of somebody right here at our club who is the class representative for the 49er, and he's been pushing skiffs on the younger guys for as long as we can remember since we were little kids at Junior Squadron. So, and all those guys that you interviewed today, Chantel and Everett and the Bjorns, like they've all been around as we've grown up and we've seen them around and we've heard their stories. And you look up to them and you're like, yeah, I wanna do that too. I wanna go to the Olympics. I wanna have the same experiences as them. And then I can come back and I can give that advice to the younger kids that are already here. You can continue racing uh, as much as you want, as little as you want. So uh, you can just race locally or at a higher level. You really choose how much time, energy, effort, money you want to put into your racing. I personally love going to games and uh, I've been lucky enough to meet great teams uh, where I've been lucky enough to qualify with these teams. So um, if I'm lucky enough the next time, I'd be happy to, to go back. More people need to realize that this is accessible. For $215 a week, which is one of the cheapest camps for any kid, I have three kids and I put them in camps all summer, you can bring them into this fenced-in compound, they supply you with a boat, instructors, and a day out in the water. And so it's, uh, we're a bit of an obscure sport. And when you stumble into it, you can realize the learning curve here is very, very uh, easy. So when you get in a boat, you don't have to learn a lot just to be able to, to sail. It teaches you lots of great skills. You make decisions, you know, um, out in the water. And uh, what a great place to be able to spend some time. It's, uh, it's a real uh, bonus for these young people to, to be able to access the water, which we don't have a lot of uh, opportunities to do. The playground is five miles by five miles. Playground, yeah, you know, that's a great the, analogy. Uh, well, it's, I mean, I took my son out the other day, and I just said, just, just go. And he was that big out <laughs> in the lake, you know? But I had my little VHF, so you all right? Yeah, I'm right. And he was almost out over at Chattagee. But then he'd come back, and like, it's totally safe. He had a life jacket on, so you're going to float if anything goes wrong. And, uh, and you can't do that. And he does hockey, but you're stuck in an arena. Uh, and you don't get to really go outside. And, uh, you know, out here... You know, you're, you're in the sun, the fresh air, uh, you have plenty of time to do it. And like I said, that playground is so cool. Uh, and there's playgrounds like this all over the world. When all the races have ended and the winners have stepped down from their podiums, what remains are our memories and admiration. Canada has a lot to feel proud of, our sailors included. If not for the mere fact that we have half the amount of practice time that our competitors, our athletes deserve the respect for their perseverance in the face of a terribly difficult feat. The Royal St. Lawrence has been supporting Olympic racers and world champions for several decades now and looks forward to continuing in the hopes of contributing more names to Canada's long list of reasons to be proud. Next episode, we explore the world of disabled sailors and how Montreal yacht clubs have implemented special programs to help bring the joy and competition of sailing to the lives of those with special needs. This program is dedicated to the memory of Ian Bruce, honorary life member of the Royal St. Lawrence Yacht Club. 
an officer of the Order of Canada and two-time sailing Olympian, Ian was best known at home and abroad as the father of the laser, the most popular sailboat the world has ever known. Ian Bruce was more than a remarkable sailor. He was a remarkable human being and a noteworthy contributor to the sport of sailing for more than 60 years in Montreal, throughout Quebec, across Canada, and around the world.